Hello everybody, thank you for having me. The middle age spread is the reasonably abhorrent term that is used to describe women's bodies once they finish menopause. My talk today is on menopause, perimenopause and weight management. So as Penny mentioned, my name is Lucy. Uh, I'm a doctor, I graduated last millennium. Uh, I have a fellowship in general practice and lifestyle medicine. Uh, is a reasonably new career change to me in the last five years. Recognising the model that we use in general practice and the fact that people, in particular women, weren't thriving led me to change tact and investigate lifestyle medicine as well as psychological medicine and clinical hypnosis. Um, as a conflict of interest, I do run an online lifestyle medicine program with my gorgeous friend, Dr. Mary Barson, uh, called Real Life Medicine. And I thought I would start with the definition of menopause. So menopause is the cessation of our periods for 12 or more months. It ends the complete cessation of ovulation and the permanent decrease in female hormone levels. This either occurs naturally or surgically for women who have had their ovaries removed. Perimenopause is the time, it's the time around menopause, actually the time leading up to menopause. It's characterized by erratic ovulation and fluctuating hormone levels. It's the fluctuation in these hormone levels that gives women many issues that profoundly affect their quality of life. The average time of perimenopause is three to four years, but it can be up to 10. So let's talk hormones. It is all about the steroids. So steroids, people think of steroids, they think of weightlifting and uh, you know fairly sorted tails, but our sex hormones are steroid hormones. We have five types of steroid hormones. The sex steroids are estrogens, progestogens, and androgens, of which there are subtypes. And then we have a little section called our corticosteroids. They're called cortico because they are made in the cortex of our adrenal gland. In the cortex of our adrenal gland are two families called glucocorticoids, which is essentially cortisol. It's all very, you know, cortisol, cortex. It's all very... Uh, I love, I love language, it's all very uh, nomenclature correct, but the glucocorticoids gives you another clue as to its involvement and it is in our stress response and glucose metabolism. The other hormones that are made in the adrenal cortex are the mineral corticoids and that is aldosterone and it is intricately linked in our salt and water balance. Now, the reason that I'm telling you about all of these hormones when my talk is about menopause is because they're all important. So we have our brain, and in our brain is a section called the hypothalamus, which many of you will have heard about, and it's in charge of lots of things. It's a bit like the conductor, and as a bossy conductor, it tells other parts of our body what to do. So it has a lovely conversation with our pituitary gland. A pituitary gland makes more hormones that talk to some of our organs. And today we're talking about the adrenal gland and the ovary. Uh, obviously, if you're a man, you don't have ovaries, you have testes instead. So the same uh, goes for them. So the fancy name for this is the HB, HPG axis the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Gonads are just the medical word for ovary or testy. And though that, that uh, axis is responsible for the three hormones of estrogen, progesterones, and androgens, and the bulk of those hormones are made there. However, we also have some uh, sex hormones made in the adrenal gland, in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Now, the glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids, they're all interlinked and you will hear over the course of this talk as to where their relevance is and why we get symptoms related to the, uh, I guess, the meshing of these five hormonal groups. Now, if you could all just memorize this slide, I'll be off. <laughs> So yeah, this is a complicated slide and it really talks about the synthesis of the hormones in the adrenal gland 
And I've really just put it up there so that A, I can remember what to tell you all, but B, so that you can see there's uh, the three sections that we've got. So the pale green is your mineral corticoids with aldosterone at the end. The sort of pale orange is the uh, glucocorticoids with cortisol at the end. And then that movie color is where your sex hormones are made. Now they all use progesterone as their, um, as in, in the, at the beginning of their, like one of the main ingredients, I guess. And then we can see that progesterone, how do we make progesterone? You need cholesterol. So I know we're at a low carb conference. I know you're gonna hear a lot about cholesterol and I know that none of you know it's the big baddie that it's made out to be, but just to make Ram that point home, it is a really important component of manufacturing our adrenal hormones and our sex hormones. Um, and again, just to emphasize that hypothalamic gonadal axis, this is how female hormones are made. In the ovary, you've got the hypothalamus talks to the pituitary, you have estrogen being made in the pre-ovulatory cycle, and then progesterone and estrogen being made in the post-ovulatory cycle. So why are all these important? We will be talking about that. And one of the things I guess I just wanted to tip my hat to is the fact that there are three types of estrogen. And the one that we talk most of when people are talking about estrogen is something called estradiol. It is the most uh, prominent, I guess, of the estrogens and the most potent. It has the little nomenclature of E2 because Americans spell the estrogen with an E and Australians and British like to shove an O in front of everything. But it's important to talk about estrone and I will come back to estrone. It is made by fat cells. It's a weaker estrogen. And then estriol is made in the um, pregnancy. It's related to the placenta. Obviously, I've mentioned progesterone is important because it's the precursor for all of our corticosteroids, and testosterone also important in, in women because it is a precursor to estrogen and has some effects in its own right. So, lovelies, by the end of this talk, you are going to be so grateful for your estrogen. For all of you who have are still ovulating, you'll be grateful for it. For all of you who are in your perimenopause or postmenopause, you'll probably wish you had some, and we'll talk about that. But estrogen is a phenomenal hormone. It really is. It doesn't get enough credit, I don't think. It is, uh, increases our bone density. We all know that. But it's important in muscle synthesis and repair. It is uh, in, integral in our ligaments and tendons and is responsible for their suppleness. And it's really important in collagen synthesis and skin elasticity. And we see that, and again, you'll find out when, as we go through. Super, be grateful. Estrogen, we love you. Obviously, in our reproductive system, it's important. It's involved with ovulation. It thickens up the endometrial lining and allows the eggs to implant when we you know, are wanting to have children. It also plumps up the genital tissues, and in particular, really important in our pelvic floor. So remember we went back to that last slide of the musculoskeletal system, and I talked about it being involved in muscle repair. It is, the pelvic floor is just a muscle. Estrogen is really important for our pelvic floor to make it as thick and strong as possible. Uh, vaginal lubrication, and it's also really important in the skin and blood vessel integrity of the, um, area down around your vaginal labia, um, et cetera. Estrogen is important in the development of glandular tissue in, and fat within the breast. So it does the two things. Now, obviously, I'm going to be mentioning that estrogen is also part of um, the drivers of, endo, of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. So whilst I'm extolling estrogen's virtues, there are some downsides, and I will be talking about those along the way. <sighs> our brain, where there are estrogen receptors in our brain. Estrogen is super important in our cognition and our thinking. And for anybody who has gone through menopause here who thinks about their brain fog and thinks they're going nuts, you're not. It is the estrogen. It is really helpful in the way we um, can think and that concept that we call clear thinking as opposed to brain fog. Estrogen is a positive mood enhancer. It's neuroprotective and you'll learn in the next uh, slide how we talk about it being an uh, inflammatory modulator. So it protects our precious brain neurons. 
It's involved in thermoregulation uh, and sleep regulation. The cardiovascular system, estrogen is phenomenally protective for women, and we know this. Women's rate of cardiovascular disease pre uh, menopause compared to postmenopause, it's all thanks to estrogen. It is protective against plaque formation. As I mentioned, it moderates a lot of that inflammation and it improves the integrity of our blood vessels. Now, estrogen is also involved in clotting. There are estrogen receptors in our liver and it affects the clotting pathways. It increases coagulability. So that's kind of potentially a downer. There is no organ untouched. Estrogen affects our metabolic health. It's involved in the glucose transport into the cells, particularly using a system called the SGLT2 system, which you will hear presumably later on in uh, the conference. But how's this? Estrogen increases your basal metabolic rate. So your basal metabolic rate is the rate at which you are lying around doing nothing and burning calories. So the amount of energy needed to run your body. I would like my basal metabolic rate to be as high as possible. And estrogen helps me out with that. Estrogen reduces insulin resistance, or you can coin it another way, by improving insulin sensitivity. Increases HDL, decreases LDL, and reduces our central adiposity. Who loves estrogen? <laughs> Hurrah for estrogen, yay. Uh, progesterone, also very important. As I said, its main benefit is that it is a precursor to all of our sex steroids. It's really, really vital, but it doesn't have quite the same beautiful effect on our um, metabolic health as progesterone does. It's largely used as a balancing agent, if you like. So yes, it is integral in pregnancy. We know that it's absolutely vital to have plenty of progesterone to maintain a pregnancy. The withdrawal of progesterone can cause labor. Um, if you don't have enough progesterone, you can have miscarriages. So again, a beautiful, lovely hormone. One of its main jobs is to balance the endometrial lining. So without progesterone, our endometrial lining gets thicker and thicker, and we end up with very big clotty periods. The withdrawal of progesterone is what causes a period. Again, progesterone, uh, progesterone receptors also important in glandular tissue, and is responsible for those cyclical changes that people get, so premenstrual breast pain and breast tenderness. Thanks, progesterone. Uh, progesterone, it's not so great on our mood. It actually probably has negative mood consequences, and we see this with women um, who are susceptible, who maybe have a marina or a rod put in, who, become, uh, have, who have lowered mood. And again, this can be profound, this mood lowering. Cravings, premenstrual cravings, you probably all remember those. Uh, yes, thank you, progesterone, again for that. And it's also involved in bloating and fluid retention. And you'll remember back to that slide I had, the one you've all wrote, learnt, um, that progesterone is involved with that aldosterone, the salt pathway. Ah, progesterone, I don't know. It increases insulin resistance. We see this, so women who are still menstruating are more insulin resistant prior to their period. And anyone who's used as a CGM, anyone who's got type one diabetes will know this. Um, it increases with pregnancy and we see this uh, with gestational diabetes. The placenta produces enormous amounts of progesterone, which is lovely because that keeps you know, the baby inside, but can also increase your risk of GDM, which then is completely removed once the baby and the placenta are born. Little nod to testosterone. As I said, it is a precursor to estrogen. It's involved in libido. It increases our bone density and increases muscle synthesis and repair. The key to the hormones is really the balance. Too much testosterone and women get acne and hirsute, and we see this in conditions like polycystic ovarian syndrome. Too little and they're tired, their hair falls out and their muscles all fade away. So, this is what we know, right, at puberty. So puberty, you've got prepubertal children are largely straight up and down. Boys have very similar body shapes to girls. Obviously, when puberty comes, uh, in we increase our estrogen and progesterone, and we increase fat deposition of the breasts, legs, bottom, hips for, for girls. And most girls hate it. It is subcutaneous fat. This is the fat that is just below the skin. 
and boys increase their testosterone and increase their muscle mass. It seems a little unfair until you remember then all the beautiful things that estrogen does for us that the boys don't get. So the great conundrum should be, right, that when we go through menopause, when we remove or reduce that estrogen and that progesterone, we should go back to be looking, you know, like the prepubertal self. Except that doesn't happen. So what does happen at menopause? Well, we know your, your estrogen decreases. It doesn't go to zero, but it does decrease dramatically. Um, so we lose the cardioprotective factors that we had. We lose the anti-inflammatory effects that we had and we actually lose the subcutaneous fat. So we do lose the fat that, that came on because of estrogen, and we see this. You see this in your face. You see women, postmenopausal women, who have lost their, you know, the plump in their cheeks, or they've lost the, um, the, the fat in the back of their arms. So that's just subcutaneous fat. Some postmenopausal women lose their bottoms. So they do. You do lose your subcutaneous fat. Tiny bit rubbish, really. You, your skin and collagen also changes, and we see this. This is why women after menopause do develop more, I guess, more wrinkles and less elastin. And obviously our bone health starts to fade away. So why do we gain weight, though? You know, we've talked about all the wonderful effects of estrogen. Well, the first thing that happens is we start to lose muscle mass. We lose this anyway. Everybody starts to lose muscle mass once they sort of start moving past 40. But just take out the estrogen and bang, it's, you have profound muscle loss. So we reduce our basal metabolic rate. That is just an independent estrogen um, cause separate to the reduction in your lean muscle mass. So we know that basal metabolic rate is, in, is directly linked to your muscle mass and this is a separate on top of. You, so that means that the food that you could eat when you were 40, the same amount of food that when you're 55, will have a different effect on your body. Obviously, we've got increasing insulin resistance now. Our estrogen is gone. I'm sure many of you have had sleep problems, okay, in that perimenopausal phase, and we know that decreased sleep is really uh, a driver of fat storage, and it affects our metabolic hormones as well. And then... I just added in another little spanner, we actually have increased cortisol. Again, completely separate to anything that is going on, just purely redu reduction of insulin increases our baseline cortisol. I just want to come back to that little bit I was talking about with the, estri the estrone. So that's made by the fat cells in the subcutaneous tissue. Subcutaneous fat has been demonised as being unhealthy. And for the majority of women, it's not. So, uh, some subcutaneous fat is normal. And I know that society and media have been wanting us, and I, you know, I grew up in, in the 80s and 90s where you couldn't be too thin, where models couldn't be thin enough. And we know that those women now are, have you know, often osteoporosis, they've got cardiac disease, they've got all the things that have gone on because they didn't have um, enough estrogen, and in particular, right back for them, they even reduce their estrogen so badly that they stop periods and all sorts of things. Subcutaneous fat. Now, I'm just going to give a slight tip of the hat to a condition called lipedema. So lipedema is a, dis a disease of connective tissue that affects the fat in these same distributions. So for many women, it affects the fat on their legs, their bottom, backs of their arms. Um, it is different to standard normal gynoid fat distribution. It's inflammatory, it's a genetic condition, and it, the fat behaves differently. It doesn't respond to traditional dieting, whereas standard subcutaneous fat does. So, interestingly, women with lipedema have huge fluctuations in that gynoid distribution of fat around puberty, pregnancy, and menopause. We don't completely understand the link, but it is there. So how do we prevent or treat weight gain that has come with menopause? I like to call it relentless self-care. So I will go through why each of these are important. Obviously, we're at the Low Carb Down Under conference. So eating a low carbohydrate, real food diet is super important to just counteract the effects of your increasing insulin resistance. It improves your lipid profile. And the key that I would say, and you will hear this from other people, is that we need to prioritise our protein. So as women, we have 
often under-eated protein in the quest for thindom and spent a lifetime basically being undernourished. So prioritise your protein. The other great thing I love about protein is that protein is the most difficult of our macronutrients to digest, which means it takes a lot of energy. So for most of us, that's good. You lie around having eaten your steak, taking burning calories to munch through it, compared to drinking a protein drink, which takes very little energy. So eating real food protein is super important. Strength training. I know, lots of people don't like strength training. Building muscle mass is vital. It counters the sarcopenia that comes with the reduced estrogen and testosterone and also counters that insulin resistance that's coming anyway. Now, the things that I would say to you, lovelies, is that there's lots of things that go on in our lives. People have various conditions, various illness. Clearly, if, if you, some of you saw me getting up the stairs, you can, yeah, I've got muscular dystrophy. It's a muscle wasting disease. I can't do strength training. There is no strength training for me. I have to then play the cards I've been given the best I can. If you have muscles and they work, use them. I implore you, your future old lady self will thank you so much. So please, that will be my one take home message for today. Learn to manage your stress, easier said than done. And part of it is that we have a really uh, poor understanding of the word stress. I think it's used interchangeably. It's used to describe anxiety. It's used to describe overwhelm. It's used to describe busyness. Stress is a physiological process involving those cortisol adren um, and other adrenal cord um, hormones, your adrenaline and noradrenaline. They have physiological effects, increasing our heart rate, increasing our blood pressure increasing our glucose. We need to be, able, we can manage those by changing sometimes the external stressors, but often we can't change the external stressor, but by changing the way we re react to that stressor and making sure as women in particular that you balance your busyness with rest and digest. So the fright and flight has to be balanced with the rest and digest phase. Now, optimising your sleep. Okay, now I recognise that if you're in your perimenopausal phase and you're waking up at 3 a.m. sweating your head off and worrying about where you're going to park the car tomorrow, that that's probably unhelpful and that is a menopausal symptom. But for lots of us, it's not that. We just don't go to bed. We like to stay out watching Netflix. We don't even give ourselves the opportunity to get enough sleep. Sleeping is like a free superpower. Inadequate sleep increases insulin resistance. Reduced sleep increases ghrelin, our hunger hormone. And inadequate sleep increases inflammation. And aren't we all trying to reduce that? I want to have a little chat about MHT. So HRT, hormone replacement therapy, is now called MHT, menopausal hormonal therapy. It got a very bad rap at one stage in about the 2000s. And part of that was that it was an oral synthetic hormones. Times have changed. For many women, they are still being given the advice that was back in the 2000s and have this fear that, um, that MHT or HRT is going to cause heart disease and cancer. There is now transdermal estrogens. Transdermal estrogens bypass the liver. There is no increased risk of clotting, no increased risk related to your cardiac disease with transdermal estrogen. Now, remember, oestrogen's where the gold is. That's, that's the one we're missing. If you are still unlucky enough to have a uterus, you will need progesterone to balance it out. So again, it's always how you frame things. Uh, the progesterone, recently there are new bioidentical progesterones that are commercially available. They have always been available, but it's been compounded and a little bit fringe. It's now commercially available in micronized dosing and is much less risk of cardiac again and cancer risk. Now, I will caveat this with this needs a robust discussion with your doctor because there are contraindications to MHT, in particular around um, uh, estrogen and progesterone receptor positive cancers, uh, and for some people, very strong family history or indeed themselves of clotting disorders. But for the majority of women, this is a, a treatment that is still not offered. So here's something to have a think about. In the 1900s, 
women's life expectancy, the average, wage, well, the average age of death was 48. If you were a black woman in America, your death rate was at 35. Now the average age, age of menopause is 52. And our life expectancy now in Australia, the average life expectancy for a woman is 86. So in 120 years, we've increased our life expectancy by 40 years. That is phenomenal. So medicine is incredibly good at keeping people alive, not so good at health span. So lifespan over health span. HRT can increase the health span. Relentless self-care, it all goes back to that. This is hard for women who are used to prioritising everybody else. It feels selfish. It feels like you're not doing your job properly. But what I would say to you is that if you don't care for yourself now, then other people will have to do it for you later. You owe it to yourself, you owe it to your family, and you owe it to society to prioritise your care. And men, if you have a woman in your life, you need to take some of the burden off her. Women are overrepresented in both workplace and uh, home duties with the burdens that they're carrying. If you like what you're hearing, please go and listen to our podcast. We have a gorgeous podcast called Real Health and Weight Loss. And this is my colleague who I work with, Dr. Mary Barson. So she's clearly the brunette. She's not here because she's just had a bubba. Um, so we have a 12-week program that obviously encompasses the whole of your lifestyle medicine because, yes, the food is important, but it's one measly bit of the puzzle. The whole rest of the puzzle is so important to get it right, and it involves addressing the two fundamentals, your physiology, which is largely your hormones, both metabolic and, your, for women, your sex hormones, and addressing your psychology, which is really understanding your mindset, what keeps you motivated, undoing the years and years of diet trauma that we've all been through. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.